I think we can start. So I'm uh, the Alkhuri Dean of the School of Architecture at the University of Miami. I'd like to thank you for joining us this evening for our first lecture in the uh, Technoglass series this uh, academic year. I'd like to first take the opportunity to thank our sponsors, Technoglass. They've been supporting us now for six years in a row and really thanks to them we are able to sustain the ambitious programming we have for you every year and we have something wonderful uh, uh, planned for this academic year and my colleague Professor Jaime Correa is going to tell you more about it uh, later. I'll leave him to elaborate on this but let, let me just say that we thanks to the virtual medium we were able to reach uh, very far, uh, shifting the spotlight from North America and uh, Europe, where the uh, center stage, let's put it this way, uh, is usually located, uh, to, to reach very widely to where we think the action is. Uh, um, and we have been doing this consistently over the years, but I think we, reached uh, uh, another level uh, in this uh, look at uh, all the exciting things happening around the world. Well, due to this far-reaching scope, the, the, the timing of the lectures will be a bit inconsistent because we had to accommodate the varying time zones. So some of the lectures will be at six o'clock and some at noon, and there's even one which should be at 7 p.m. I mentioned this because we are all used to the 6.30 p.m. So uh, I don't want you to take it for granted and be attentive to the, the different timing we have this year. Uh, I have mentioned the hybrid, uh, I mean the, the online format, but actually it's more of a hybrid because in some instances we will have an event on the ground in person complementing the uh, teleconferencing on the screen. So for instance, uh, we, we may have a panel discussion like we do today, but rather than do it virtually, we will have it actually in person in our uh, auditorium uh, and therefore we will be able to accommodate students and faculty for this, uh, what we, for this live event. So more on this uh, shortly. Uh, um, also, I remind you that in parallel to the Technoglass series, we have the current series, which usually takes place on Mondays. This year it's Monday at six o'clock and it will launch on Monday, October 26th with Don Ruggles. And uh, without holding uh, further the uh, proceedings this evening, I'd like to welcome Professor Jaime Correa to tell you more about our speaker tonight uh, and uh, the series. Thank you. So thank you, Dean El Huri. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. And thank you for joining us. I'm Jaime Correa, Professor in Practice at the School of Architecture of the University of Miami and the coordinator of this lecture series, at least this year. On behalf of the School of Architecture of the University of Miami and Technoglass, I would like to welcome you to the fall lecture series of 2020. But before we start, let me remind you to keep your microphones off. This will facilitate the smooth deliverance of the lecture without unnecessary interruptions. So again, please keep your microphones off at all times. At the end of the lecture, we will have a panel discussion led by distinguished professor Jean-Francois Lejun, Florian Sotevomos and Shona Meyer. There will also be an opportunity for questions. And if you have any questions or if you need any type of clarification, please use the chat box on the right hand side of your screen or have patience and wait until the end of the lecture. Tonight, we are honored to host Thomas Pfeiffer from Thomas Pfeiffer and Partners in New York City. Thomas Pfeiffer is best known for his museums in North Carolina and Maryland, for his pavilions at Race 
Rice University in Houston for his City Lights design competition entry in, 26, in uh, 2006 in New York City, his courthouse in Salt Lake City, and for his impeccable modern houses in New York State. His body of work has resulted in a beautiful monograph published by uh, Skira Rizzoli, which if you try to find in Amazon.com, you will see that it costs $1,000 a piece. But I'm going to let him be the one to tell us about his extraordinary body of work. All I can advance is what John King, the architecture critic of the San Francisco Chronicle, said about his work. Mr. Pfeiffer is a master of meticulous modernism. Thomas Pfeiffer was born in South Carolina, obtained a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in architecture from Clemson. He also studied in Genoa, Italy for about 10 years and until about 1996, he worked with the office of Richard Meyer. In 1996, he received the Rome Prize for the, from the American Academy in Rome. And in 1997, he established Thomas Pfeiffer and Partners in New York where he's currently one of the eight directors in this office. He has received more than 20 awards from the American Institute of Architects. He's been a keynote lecture speaker at the Royal Institute of British Architects, recipient of the Arts and Letters Awards, Award in Architecture from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Thomas Pfeiffer is currently a fellow of the American Institute of Architects and serves on the boards of the Architectural League of New York and the Sir John Soane's Museum Foundation in London. As if all these accomplishments were not enough, he has been a Louis Kahn visiting professor at Yale University and has also taught at Columbia, Cooper Union, University of Texas, University of Southern California, Clemson, University of Pennsylvania, and Cornell. By now, it should be clear that we indeed will be in the presence of an individual whose purpose has been to advance knowledge, to share it generously with the world, and to practice with a lot of passion and commitment. So on behalf of the School of Architecture in Technoglass, please let me welcome Thomas Pfeiffer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? Is this working? Yes. <laughs> you know, it's awfully nice to be here. And I'm sorry I can't be here in person. Uh, you know, I was giving a talk last week. I'm located now in upstate New York uh, during the pandemic. And right when I was about 30 seconds before I was supposed to start speaking, my electricity and the internet went out. <laughs> so. <laughs> So it's awfully nice uh, that we have a good, clear connection here. Um, and, and I'm really excited to talk to you about, about uh, some of our recent work here. So let's get started, Ken. So this has been a really important image for us. This is Ed Reinhardt. Ed Reinhardt, the painter, and he is sitting looking at one of his pictures, these black pictures, these endless space pictures. And if you look long enough, you see this figure, this other figure that begins to emerge. And if you read about him, he wanted you to sit and to simply get lost in the work and get rewarded with this second figure. He wanted you to slow down. He wanted you to prepare. And so as we started this project for the Glenstone Museum just outside of Washington, DC, we wanted to try to turn this, this idea of slowness, this idea of getting lost in the work into, into an experience for Glenstone, okay? We have nicknamed this house, this museum, the House of Rooms, because the program was unusual. Rather than having a big, open, flexible space, 
we have 11 rooms here. And these 11 rooms, with the exception of the largest one there, are curated with one artist or one work in perpetuity. And each one of these was worked on, was designed in collaboration with the artist for their proportion, for their light, and sit, sat, it sits there with this experience of moving from room to room, okay? And the site is an amazing site. It sits on this existing peninsula that was there that we found where some old barns had been. And we wanted to build where others had built so that we wouldn't disturb the rest of the topography, the rest of the landscape. So this, this site has these, um, has these uh, rooms that are sitting on this peninsula and you walk around the peninsula as your experience, okay? The site plan is very simple. You arrive there to the top of the slide, you park in one of the groves, you arrive to a timber building, and then you simply walk. You walk to the cluster of pavilions that are there and you walk and you walk through the topography. Every step, the world begins to drop away and you begin to prepare yourself for the art experience. The books and the arrival is all of this, um, this timber building and the food, the cafe is kept away too. It's one of the buildings that's further away in the woods so that these pavilions are about this art experience, okay? And so as you're walking on this path, you begin to see the pavilions as, as they sit in the landscape on this, on this peninsula. And each one of the pavilions has its own proportion, its own character of light. We pull them apart to honor them so that each one is softly placed in the topography like these concrete vitrines so that you can have the art and the architecture and the landscape come together, okay? These, these are these um, kind of charcoal drawings that we figured out how to make on the computer. And it shows these so many images that we made of this as a way um, to, to, to make these buildings as we were working with the artists composed, sitting in the landscape. That one building there that's to the right is a building that we call the pause room, where you pause, there's a bench, and you um, get lost in the landscape before continuing, okay? And so this is the Ankara room. It's tall, it's 45 feet tall with another 20 feet for a concrete oculus. So it gives the light a long way to fall. The floor, un under the wood floor is charcoal. Behind the walls is white marble, just as Ankara instructed. We talked about this tall proportion this scale, this, this light that falls down um, onto the work. All of the rooms here, with the exception of one that is, that is not meant to have natural daylight for its installation, but all of the others are daylit, so you can feel the light move around the room, okay? And so here is the Bryce Martin room, and we worked this is a very particular painting that he painted here. And we worked with him on the character of the light, the proportion of the room, the way the light moved around the room and um, how this room would, would be a part of this experience, okay? And just before Cy Twombly passed away, we happened to work with him on the proportion of his room these amazing sculptures that he made were made between 1951 and 1991. He made these over 40 years and they sit here in this room with light from the top 
and we worked with him. <laughs> he pinned our drawing up that elevation, that charcoal elevation with us. And he had one comment all day about the architecture. He said, don't be afraid of abstraction. Can you imagine Cy Twombly giving that as a critique? It was an amazing critique that I'll remember for a long, long time. Okay. This is, the, this is one of the cubic rooms, a kind of Renaissance cube. This is a pape moment here um, and, and a beautiful work, top lit with an oculus, lights the work and is through this um, passage that comes from the passage around the pool, okay? And then one of the rooms is outdoors. You walk in the passage, you walk into the Michael Heiser room, it's outdoors. The proportioning of this room, the rotation of his work, the materiality here is, is Michael Heiser and this work celebrates um, these, these works in the movement of the light, okay? This is this pause room with this amazing Martin Purrier bench. So after you've gone through five, six of the rooms, you sit, you are in front of this enormous piece of glass that's framing the landscape that you witnessed in your journey coming to the pavilions. It's made of wood. The bench is made of wood. And it has this moment here that heightens the experience of the landscape. It's like a Japanese tea house. It, it heightens the movement of the light, the passage of time, and this sense of calm as you prepare yourself for the rest of the pavilions, okay? This is, this is a view of what I call the passage that moves around this pool of water that was, that was modeled on, um, on um, a Japanese um, um, pavilion that I'll tell you about in a second, but it was, it was modeled then on light you know, the shade and the shadow belongs to the light. And so as you move around this passage and as you move into the pavilions with the art, which are lit, the, the, the changing light then of moving back out into the passage and back into the shade and the shadow and then back into the light is the way that this passage is choreographed. All of the artificial light is turned off and you move and you're guided by the daylight. This, this little passage goes into the Bryce Martin room. So you move from this shadow, the shadow and the light, this kind of mystery of the darkness. The shadow, this dark shadow is a part of the light, okay? And so the pavilions sit around this pool, this pool with these changeable, um, pieces here uh, that are down in the water. The landscape architects change the plantings as often as they wish, uh, but, but the size of this was modeled on Rianji, the, the rock garden there, where, the, where, where this is open to the sky. It's not open to the horizon. It's open to the light and to the sky. And every time you leave a pavilion, you come back to this moment of sitting on a bench and looking out at the garden here, this water garden, and you prepare yourself with time and distance to see the next pavilion, to see the next work. It's that preparation, this slowing down, this seeing, this getting lost in this passage as you move from one work to the next work, okay? Just another view of the pond here. That's the taller building that you just saw there with Ankarara. And then there's another, um, that's the front entry room there with the, with the window that looks out on the garden. 
One of my favorite images is this image of standing here in the passage, sitting on a bench, looking out um, on this water garden and the plants and the light and getting the preparation, okay? I love concrete. <laughs> I love concrete because it's, it has a sense of permanence and it's handmade. The forms, the stripping of the forms. If you're lucky enough to strip a form just after it rains or when it's raining, you get these permanent streaks. We have 25,000 blocks on the project and each, and we're poured over a year and a half. And each one was poured in a different temperature and a different humidity, a different day, different, slightly different mix, but just normal gray concrete. And you feel this material, this living material that comes and cloaks these buildings, okay? And we began to make this, these renderings, these kind of, this kind of tapestry of this material to honor the material and to express its true nature. We didn't have any additives. We didn't have any retarders, anything that would, that would harm the beauty of the way this concrete and these blocks would age over time and how they would express the lighter blocks. The lighter blocks are poured in the summertime and then they hydrate when they're stripped the darker blocks are poured in the wintertime and they hold the water. And that begins to express this kind of natural and honest process. Okay. And so here they are. This is, this is uh, almost like a Walter de Maria with them sitting out in the yard here after they've been poured and stacked and numbered as they began to get shipped to the site, okay? And then they were placed, they were hand placed. These, these folks, how these three people changed the project, placed these blocks with this remarkable precision here, remarkable concision, precision. You can't find a joint that's off. And these three folks are craftsmen, this lost, this lost profession, this lost craft, okay? And we, we also wanted wood. When you come and you touch a door handle, a handrail, we wanted those to be carved and in place so that you feel the wood, you feel the materiality, okay? And then here's one of my favorite pictures of the building under construction with the cranes in front, the blocks have been set, still working on the pool in the middle of the building, but it has this kind of raw quality. We dug, we dug the site to make the building, then we, we, we x-rayed it, we surveyed it, so that as the topography goes back, it goes back exactly the way that it was before we arrived, so that you walk around this peninsula as your experience. Okay. And then I want to move to the Corning Museum of Glass very quickly here, because we had never done a museum of glass. And the first thing we did when we were fortunate enough to receive the commission, we took a simple alto vase out on to the out onto a street in New York, right outside of our office. And all of a sudden that piece of glass came alive in the light. It absolutely came alive. And so we began to search and it turns out that the light does not harm glass. The glass can take an enormous amount of light. Temperature and humidity does, but not, not light, okay? And so we, we began to make um, and I use this word often, this vitrine for contemporary glass. Here is the Corning campus, and you can see our building sitting there off this green 
very simple rectangle, completely top lit with light. And it begins to express this container of contemporary art, this whiteness, this contemporary sense that this, that this white vitrine contains these contemporary works, okay? And it sits up at this, this Wallace Harrison building from the 1950s. This green, this lawn, this kind of living room on the Corning campus, it sits and has this conversation with this, with, with these enormous pieces of white glass that we put there um, on that side as this abstraction in the same way that Wallace Harrison was trying for that abstraction in glass opposite us, okay? And some of the skylights here, because light doesn't damage art. This glass is not damaged by light. And so we, we, we let some clear glass appear on, in the skylights as well, so that in some parts of the day, these direct sun rays come through and begin to watch the light move, watch the passage of the light and the passage of time during the day and through the seasons, okay? And so the rooms are very soft. All of the work sits on the floor. It's really a museum about sculptural, sculpture and glass. So the rooms are very soft. And these beams, these concrete beams support the skylights and they direct the light directly down on the glass directly down. And so these rooms were meant to be clouds, soft clouds, and they begin to let the art itself be the star of the show, okay? And then when these soft rooms come together in some places, they make these corners, these entrances, these portals, these thresholds from this passage that moves around these, these this pavilion. So that in some places you get this, these views out, and in other places you move into these five rooms for the art. But these walls are thick walls. They contain the mechanical system. They're the sheer um, structure and take the vertical loads of the building. So they are the building there. And these beams sit on them and transfer all of the loads, all of the wind loads from the facade directly into these walls. And these beams are four inches thick and three feet tall. They're kind of remarkable, in some cases, 60 feet long. And they are the kind of poetry behind the building, okay? You can see the softness of the walls and the portals, the beams sitting on these walls, transferring the loads and making the, making the light, coming together to make this light that illuminates the work, okay? And then, so this white glass that is, that is shrouding this, this vitrine, we wanted it to also uh, cloud this piece of vision glass so that you, you don't have a piece of clear glass there, you have a piece of frosted glass, so that you begin to feel this layer. You feel this layer of, of light and of glass that's coming in front of you, so that it is this mist and this way of seeing the landscape, okay? And so now, when you're, when you're inside the building here, when you're inside and you're about to move into these portals, you begin to see the beams and the thick walls and the, the kind of sculptural nature of the walls as these five rooms begin to get organized. Um, this is Fred Wilson's hanging chandelier. You can begin to see that little cubic piece of light that's coming, a little square piece of light that's coming down that changes all day long from the piece of light that's above, okay? 
And so this is, this is a, an amazing photograph by Ewan Bond that is um, looking straight up at these beams. These beams are about three feet on center. They're just enough to get a lift up there to change the light bulbs, to work on the skylight, to work on the smoke detectors, and to channel the light. We built so many physical models, so many computer models, um, that we, this building is a working building as well. All of the air comes out of the top of the walls and gets, to, gets and falls over the space and gets returned through those slots that are in that left-hand image there. Okay. And so here is one of my favorite photographs of the pavilion before it's finished is it sits there on the campus with these big white um, panels of glass as it sits there in this ensemble on the campus. Okay. And so now I just want to talk briefly before I get to Warsaw about um, this building that we're doing in Bogota at the moment. It's a headquarters and it sits just on the outskirts of Warsaw, I mean of, um, of Bogota. And it's made out of this white concrete that you see on the right hand side there. This concrete that is um, uh, with, these, with this enormous gargantuan scale, okay? And so for a long time, we worked with a structural engineer. We're in a big earthquake zone here and we wanted to take this zoning envelope, which, is, which has these slight pitches in it. We wanted to take these slabs of concrete so that the building would open up to the landscape, open up to the mountains. And you would allow then this structure, given, given the, sh the shear, the earthquake loads, the wind, to begin to reflect what those forces might be. The one thing that's not in here is the core, um, but all of these then have been designed with this earthquake earthquake and shear and vertical load forces taken into account. We worked closely with Skidmore's and Merrill, our structural engineer for almost every project to work on the composition of these, okay? And so each one of these columns is not a tilted column. It is a series of straight segments that comes, some, in some cases it leans back against the facade and they begin to stack one on top of the other, okay? And so then each one of the facades, we built this model um, that's quite large in our office to understand how these columns might stack up and move and how the forces would change as this building is put into, into, its, into its force with, with an earthquake, with sheer wind forces, with vertical loads, um, and began to set up this kind of poetic rhythm as the building moves from the street up into the skyline, okay? You can see the in facade here with one column as it moves up, okay? And then the other side, it's tipping away from you, just like the facade to the right there. And as these columns begin to compose themselves, they dance their way up to the top and just to give you a sense of scale, those columns are, are about a meter, a little bit over a meter square. They're, they're, they're large, they have a kind, kind of heroic nature to them and they're that white concrete, this kind of honorific presence there, okay? And here's the other facade, this facade is also leaning back so these columns are leaning back, but they're stacked in there um, as they move up the facade, okay? And so now I wanna start a little bit on this final project that, you know, it's the kind of project that comes along rarely in your life. 
Um, it's a museum and a theater for Warsaw in Poland. And it, it begins in this, this journey has been going on now for five years. And it starts in 1955. I'm sorry, 1947 there. And these are photographs that the architect Harry Cobb put, shot for us. You know, he went to Harvard. He got a, he got a Fulbright to travel across Europe. And when he arrived in Warsaw, he found the way that um, the Russians had left this city, bombed from within. And he photographed this in color. And he had an exhibition there in Warsaw three years ago with his photographs. No one had ever seen Warsaw in color. And so Harry's pictures, the, 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 these museums, this, this museum was overrun with, with people seeing what this city looked like in 1947 in color through Kodachrome film, okay? And so then after the Germans came in and completely leveled the city, the Russians, um, put this palace of culture up in 1955 as a gift to the Polish people. It's this kind of Chicago style building. And you can see that there's a subway that's being constructed underneath. This building, you can see that there's a little bit of rebuilding that's going on, but this palace of culture, this white building, this kind of symbol of oppression was built there in 1955, along with a lot of the infrastructure that's beginning to come in, okay? And so then in, in the intervening um, years, there has been this kind of anonymous architecture that's arrived, this kind of commercial glass architecture, this kind of solid punched window housing, anonymous architecture that's arrived in the city of Warsaw that's built up all around. And, okay. And so our site is right at the base of the palace that you see here in the left-hand photograph. It's right on the right-hand side, those right-hand bosque of trees there. And you can see that this is the center of Warsaw. It is absolutely the center. And this is where they have soccer celebrations. It's where they have rallies. It's where they have protests. If you'd followed the news there in Poland, there's a lot of, of differing opinions, very populist government, a lot of rallies, a lot of soccer victories. They just had a great tennis victory um, in the French Open. They had a big rally and get together there. So we're building in the middle of Warsaw. So these buildings have a voice and they speak, okay? But also this, this art and this theater is not something that you'd see, for instance, at the Museum of Modern Art. This is Polish art it has a voice of the times that they're living in now. And so does the theater. These theatrical performances are about these times that they're living in. These are not about making Jeff Koons works here. Of course, Jeff is a remarkable artist, but that's not the art that's here. This art is about a voice that these folks have in this time, it's, it's completely reflective of the times that they're living in, okay? And so we began early on to, to, to focus in on a material, a study of materials and a study of the atmosphere of each one of the buildings. And we began to look first at the theater and this kind of, um, kind of mystery 
this kind of dark shadow that is so much a part of their theatrical performances. So the lights and the actors and the performers and, and the audience and the sets, they all become the light. And so we began to think about this work of architecture, this vitrine there that is this dark shadow that is part of the light that it inspires this kind of mystery within the building. And you don't get this kind of mystery, this darkness without a little bit of light. So these openings were made according to the program, this kind of attachment to this, to this darkness within the architecture, okay? But then for the museum, as much as the light, this darkness that's a part of the light is a part of the theater, this dark, this light is, is, is the idea behind the museum. So that the artworks are lit with the light of Warsaw. This image on the right hand side is a part of this top floor gallery. You climb in the building and you arrive to a completely top lit ceiling where these galleries are seven and a half meters tall. This celebration, this honorific place in the city celebrates these works in these heroically scaled galleries up at the top of the building, okay? And so there is, there are some of the first columns that were being poured this last week of these, of this white architecture here, this white concrete, this optimistic vitrine for this contemporary work. And then on the right-hand side, as this theater, this blackened theater, this kind of mystery of shadows, this deep space there um, is, the, is the theater as it sits next to the Palace of Culture that the people of Warsaw have taken back over again now as their, as their, as their place with their arts, with their theaters, it's their place, okay? And I love this image of Richard Serra, this, this kind of, he, he made this piece of linen with ink. He stapled it to the wall. It's got this kind of thinness to it, this kind of deep space. It, it is boundless space. You can't you can't see the end of it. And this blackness here was hugely important to us, okay? And I love this place that this Balka made for the Tate there, for the Turbine Hall. Um, this, he was my critic <laughs> when we were practicing making this building over the last four or five years. He was the one at dinner where I'd show the work to, and any time I would propose something, anything remotely delicate or in any way decorative, he would stare me down at dinner. He wanted this work of architecture in Warsaw to be without meaning. And he made this work in the, in the Turbine Hall I love the way the Guardian newspaper described it as the heart of darkness. And he named it how it is. So this, this artist was, was talked about this sense of that Richard Serra wanted. You walk up this ramp and you're in this darkened place, this boundless deep space, okay? And so we, but we also wanted this building, this deep space to be a part of the city. So you can open up these enormous doors, the size of aircraft hangar doors, and you can walk through the theater. The one thing the director of the theater has been very clear on is he wants this theater to be a part of the life of the city of Warsaw. When they're building the sets for, the, for, a, for a performance, he wanted you to be able to walk through the theater and watch the sets being built before performance. He wanted you to be able to 
sit on the steps and to watch the makeup being, being applied. He wanted you to be able to share a performance with the square, with the square inside and the folks inside. There's a turntable inside that has flexibility. This is a flexible hall, the size of a hangar. And we've got skylights. We've got a few skylights in here. We've got clear story in here. We've got lights that are um, glass that's coming in on the ground floor so that as this space is dark, it has the light. Even a space that's intended to be dark should have enough light to show us how dark it really is. And so these doors can open up and welcome um, Warsaw, okay? And so here is the master plan. Um, here you can see the theater there on the right hand side of the little figure ground there and the theater to the left, okay? And so then these two buildings sit in dialogue together. They live together, they're different institutions, the visual arts and the performing arts. They sit on the square. They sit with this living room in between where they can have performances, where they can have art. That is there, that is the place where these two come together, okay? And then the way this building, this theater, this sits up against the palace, it has that scale, that simplicity as it addresses the columnar nature of the palace from 1955 with these heavy poured steel columns and steel plates from the shipyards up in Gdansk, okay? We focused on the materiality, the permanence of these buildings, the permanence of concrete. The city has a, has, a, has a history. The sense of permanence was important. This sense of this kind of honesty of the material as it sits there in these two buildings have their dialogue together. Everything is heavy. Everything is there. It has a presence in this city and it has this, it had to have a presence because it is, it is in between the palace and it's in between this kind of glass commercial architecture. It had to be strong architecture, strong buildings there that could deal with the history of this place and deal with this materiality, okay? And we did just, just, just for a moment, we had this strict zoning ordinance that was passed by the city, city council. So this was not to be changed. It dealt with the height, it dealt with the arcades, it dealt with the volumes as they sat on the square, okay? And then these are the sections, the palace is there to the left, that enormous um, kind of aircraft hangar room uh, that's there, um, opens directly to the palace there, as well as through those enormous doors. Um, all, of the, all of the changing rooms and all of the, um, all of the back of house is there in the poche, and um, all of the rehearsal halls are there to the right-hand side, as well as the black box. And then over on the museum side, there's a ground floor, um, and there are two floors, each of about seven meters as they rise up. The light that's coming in, in in that middle floor comes in from the edges, and the light that comes from the top is this light that comes with Warsaw as you climb through, okay? And then some models from our office showing the dialogue here of one building to the next, okay? And then this center room, these two buildings as they open to one another, these big windows that are there that open, one with darkness, one with light, white concrete and this darkened metal there as they sit in dialogue together, okay? 
and then a rendering. This tower here actually goes down. This is an art tower with an installation at the very top and it goes down to the cinema so that the cinema has a presence as it comes and reaches uh, the level on minus one, okay? And then on the top floor, this is also the house of rooms with thresholds in between. And you, you notice these big beams that I'll, that I'll talk about in a second. Some are larger and then these thinner beams that allow the light to come through and wash these top floors with this um, celebratory light, okay? And so these beams then, we're, we're building over that subway. It took us a year to get above grade. And so one didn't know what was down there. And so these, these columns are placed at, in this uneven rhythm that land on either side of the subway to span over. And so these big beams there are a reflection of the structure that's coming all the way down and landing. So those beams are big and they support the buildings. These smaller beams span between those and carry the floor loads, but they also carry the skylights above. So it's a reflection of the archeology span and the experience of what, what's happening below the grade. You, you can see the clear story light on the bottom left and, and on the bottom right and this top light that's coming down on these seven and a half meter rooms. And then these thick thresholds that are a little bit like the Glenstone Museum, these, these thickened walls that you walk through and have that experience of moving from one room to the next, this kind of house of rooms, okay? And, you know, the director of the museum and the curatorial staff did not want big, flexible rooms like is so popular today. She wanted rooms of different scales, different sizes, so that the art had to adapt, the curators had to adapt to these sizes, to this scale, to the light, that the rooms were more particular with the art rather than these flexible rooms that are made there with this, with walls that you can install with the art. These are very specifically sized rooms, okay? And so then as we started, this is this notion of the house of rooms. We started with these square rooms and began to organize it because of the zoning envelope. We had to organize this experience of what the director Joanna um, thought were these four different occasions, these four different atmospheres for different sizes of rooms. Some had slightly lower ceilings, the ones on the roof, different sizes. And so we began to look at these figure grounds in the way that one would look at a neighborhood in, in a city. And we, we, we began to kind of sculpt this experience of moving one to the next, okay? And so then we wanted these, just like in Glenstone, these kind of rooms, these pause rooms. And we began to nickname these blue rooms that you see there as these city rooms. So as you're going through one of the atmospheres, these four atmospheres in these upper level plans, you come to these blue rooms, which are wood lined, and you have a big window there to the city and you pause and you reflect, you get, you, you get a sense of orientation, you get a sense of light, you get a sense of warmth, you have a connection back to the city, and then you make it through the rest of the atmospheres there. And then the image to the left is the ground floor, this kind of continuous arcade made of these really big columns that are down there, these piers, that filter people into the museum. There's a skirt that comes down and you walk under the skirt and all of a sudden you get a six meter high ground floor space that's completely glass. There's, so there is this blue area, is this threshold that you move from the city 
to this arcade and into the interior of the building. And on that ground floor, we have a reaction gallery here that's a part of the city where, where, where the director will give an artist a space and in a month, he has to feel the pulse of what he's experiencing and make a very quick um, work of art that gets placed there. There are big sliding doors that can open up. There's an auditorium there behind that, behind that wall where they have performances that open to the square. There's a stairway there that goes up. I'll show you in a second. There's an educational space, a bookstore, a cafe. This building is completely porous and open to the city. And the galleries have these particular framed heightened views to the rest of Warsaw, okay? And here's one of these pause rooms uh, made out of ash, local wood from outside of Warsaw as these pauses between these rooms for art, okay? The building is made out of this white concrete in different layers. There's a, there's a slot in the middle that that top large opening is actually an outdoor terrace. The slot to the right, the thin one is a library. The one over the entrance there is, is one of the galleries. So there are these punctures in this facade, but this facade is heroic. It's solid, it's pierced. It has a presence um, there in Warsaw with this white concrete as it sits next to the palace and next to this commercial architecture, okay? Here's the library as it sits, that's open to the public with an enormous window there back to Warsaw, okay? And here is this facade that faces the boulevard there that faces across the street from the commercial, okay? And then this stair that moves up right in the heart of the building. We looked at the Palazzo Barberini. This idea that the stair is the heart of this project and it's a social space. So many museums are, the experience is a part of an elevator that goes up and down. But this, we wanted this to be this space that was filled with daylight. And it's not one, one stair, it's two stairs that are mirrored across this diagonal axis. So as you walk up one, your friends are walking down the other way. You meet, you see other people. This experience in the middle is this collective experience, this big concrete white presence in the middle of a city, this kind of vertical piazza here that is finally modeled on this, um, this, this wonderfully celebratory stair in Palazzo Barberini, okay? And then, so we studied this stair with these enormous models in our office. You can see how the stair is kind of a mirror of one another across the diagonal there as it, um, as it winds up, okay? And then just to close with the theater and this, the composition, we, we let these spaces be what they wanted to be, the height they wanted to be, where they wanted to be placed to work well. This is a building that works with its program. So the, the rehearsal spaces, the black boxes, the, 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 um, the wardrobes, everything had its own window, had its own purpose. And these windows begin to come back to, to the facade and express these, this darkness, okay? And we love this image right here. This was pinned up, this Louise Nevelson, these kind of crevices, these holes, these black holes where you can never see the back of this. It just has this, has this kind of atmosphere of this, of this darkness um, that is just a part of this shadow. It's a part of this kind of, and, and, and I love this, the guardian, the heart of darkness, these little dark crevices, okay? 
And so then every facade is composed with what it wants to be. That big window that's there to the left-hand side in the top left image is, is the black box. And it has this huge window that can be opened to the park that's right there, this green park that's right next to the city square. You can see the big doors there that open all the way through the building so that people can walk through and participate in these works of this time. That little slot that's down there, the one to the bottom right, are the offices, okay? And so then I close with these, with these um, atmospheric renderings, this, this kind of um, nature of these two buildings coming together around this civic public square here and um, over time becoming a part of this vibrant city. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, amazing presentation. Um, just before I turn it over to my colleagues, uh, I'm, I must say that I'm overtaken by the perfect attunement of each one of your projects to the sensorial experience of real humans. Uh, that, that's unusual these days, I mean, with so much technology. Uh, I mean, so much computer technology. Uh, I see that you have like a certain phenomenological uh, approach to architecture, which you challenge us to see time differently. I mean, to see shadows and light, to uh, hear sounds, to sense feelings, to stay in balance to look at spatial sequences, et cetera. And I can see that clearly, I mean, like definitely, that your experience of Rome somehow had influenced the craftsmanship, the uh, materiality, the solidity, the atmospheres of your buildings. Now, the students are asking me if there's, besides the influence of Rome, is there a connection to the East? I mean, they, they're talking about Hindu buildings and uh, Japanese and Chinese architecture. Is there anything like that uh, in, in your um, experience? Well, just, um, just I, think, I think two points. Yes, I have certainly um, learned from, from those tea houses. I learned from Riangi how you walk through the garden and you discover that place. You sit on the bench, you see the rock garden, the horizon is taken out, the light is moving and casting shadows from the rocks onto the gravel. You only see the landscape and you only see the sky and the light. And so you, the world begins to drop away with the light. And so Riangi has been hugely important to me as this experience with that, with this light and with kind of taking the horizon out, out of the picture, out of your experience and allowing the sky and the light to, to begin to mark that time that I keep talking about. But then also the, the simple notion of the Japanese tea house and how those windows, those openings frame the garden. And of course, when you go there, you sit on the floor, you look out of the garden and you watch the shadows move and you watch the light move and you watch the garden change and you watch as your time is passing. And so if you could find a way to capture that spirit of the moving light in architecture and mark this passage of time. That was one thing that I was, I mean, I never, I'm not sure I really do as it is, but um, that's one thing as I was walking around Rome, it's interesting you say that. I was focused on light. I went over there 
I wanted to learn about light and you, and you walk in the darkness, in the ruins, in below the ground. You, you go and you're like an archeologist and you come to the, to the Parthenon, I mean, to the Pantheon and, and you learn constantly about light down the little streets and you, and, and you, and you see the light. And so um, I have absolutely learned from, from the Japanese and history and from Rome. Those are two very interesting observations. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it on to um, Florian Soter. Yes, also thank you from my side. Uh, I think it was a wonderful, wonderful lecture. You hear me? Yes, I hear you well. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I had, I, had, I had somehow similar, and I took some notes and uh, um, I, I was also very much impressed by this extreme uh, reductionism, let's call it minimalism of your work. Um, these extremely quiet, pristine spaces. Uh, so, so I noticed there's a certain tension and also the way you described them is between a kind of metaphysical dimension. You talk about the secrecy of things, the secrecy of shadows. And at the same time, there is this strong confrontation with the physical. A lot of talking about the material power, the ornaments through building. Um, um, so maybe, I mean, just, just, just maybe, maybe, I mean, just to get going at the same time, also you had this strong sentence related to that uh, craftsman, this lost profession. I, I guess that was in relation to the American context. Uh, but, but how do you reconcile these two dimensions? So, so this, the, the, the metaphysical and, and the physical. Well, you know, um, I've always thought that if you reduce a space to the material and the light, and you take those two, um, those two materials, because I call material, I mean, I call light a material as well, that, that, I think we we make we try we try to to make these spaces that are have the experience have the have the experience of the light and the materials and when you reduce everything else you begin to feel those two you begin to feel the light the movement of the light, and also you begin to feel the material. And for me, the more cluttered, the more decorative, the more delicate in, in, in a lot of our later work, the more delicate, I think it begins to distract. You know, your, your eye begins to move and it begins, and then the light begins to fall and the materiality begins to fall away a bit. So I think with these later projects, and you know, you kind of understand why it takes a lot of buildings to, to even even scratch the surface. But this sense of materiality and and light, I think, are what we are finally coming back to. And of course, we could have never made this leap without Lou Kahn. I mean, you've got a kind of give Khan his due. I mean, in the way he talked about light, but in the way Dhaka is organized with shade and shadow and light, how he talked about the light. I mean, how he talked about shadow being a part of the light. I mean, I'm certainly gravitated to, to, to this notion of light and tried to really understand it as best I can. I'm glad you mentioned his name because I was, I was thinking about him occasionally when you talked. Yeah, well, I also want to go back. You're from Switzerland, right? Yes, yes. The, the other thing that's been hugely important to me, we go hiking every summer in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And there is this movement of the body that I've loved, hiking in, in the Alps. 
mm. and the movement of the body and the movement of the arms and the walking through the fields and feeling nature, coming upon these little villages that are filled with light, the light and, the, and these little valleys and the kind of heroic nature of the landscape there. I mean, I, I, I wanted to say, I thought you were from Switzerland. And, and, so, but, and so that has become, I don't think the work would be the same, or whatever it is, I don't think the work would be the same had I not had that experience in Switzerland every summer of trying to feel the body moving through these spaces. It's, a, it's, it's, it's extremely experiential mm. there to me and almost a kind of religious experience. I mean, maybe I make just a last comment because you talk about Switzerland. I was, of course, also thinking about Zumtor. Of yes. The time. When you well, talk today, yes. because you mentioned, I mean, the terminology atmospheres came up a lot. Yes, but yes. Also, also, he is making a lot of use of very dark spaces. So yes. I, I think, but I don't want to, uh, first of all, I don't want to take away the, the space from my, uh, the time space of my fellows. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank you. Maybe Shauna, you want to take, take, yeah, take on I think, the mic? Uh, again, uh, thank you for sharing uh, your work with us and in our student body. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's an amazing body of work. Um, and it's, it's also uh, almost can be overwhelming, right, when you're being introduced to your work, maybe for the first time if you are students and maybe think, how do you get there and, and how could you achieve something like this? And I'm wondering, um, in, in an effort to relate your work a little bit more to our students and their process, if you can talk about how you expand the use of section and, and designing and thinking in section, you know, as a tool in your design process, um, not only as, you know, a representation, but it's very clear that, you know, the end artifacts of your building are all really about that sectional experience. You've talked a lot about, you know, letting the light in and not understanding the horizon, but maybe just more of a speaking to the process of, of making through section. Well, you know, you, um, you know, what, what I think is, is hugely important in the making of architecture is trusting the process. It's absolutely trusting the process because, you know, when I was starting my, my practice, I was frantic about making architecture. I didn't really know what to make. Um, and so whenever I would come upon an idea, I would just stop right there. And I would stop and I would just make that. And then slowly I began to learn that you need to not stop, that you needed to continue to have curiosity and continue to investigate and whenever you think you have it, you don't have it. And you have to keep pressing ahead and don't be afraid of change. Don't be afraid to re-examine something. That's, that's the first thought because that, I mean, that's hugely important and that takes a long time to learn, at least for me. Um, secondly, I grew up and, um, and worked, was in school and I was always taught to start with the plan and move to the section and move to the elevation. I worked for an architect named Charles Guathamy early, early on back in, back in 1980. And he, he started with the plan. He moved to the section and he moved to the elevation. Um, I think our process is a little bit more fluid than that because we do pin up in the office, a lot of inspirational images. And we, we have a stack of cards that we usually make for every project. It's the way we communicate with our clients that has um, cards with pictures of nature, of architecture, of culture, of the landscape, of any number of things there. And we use those to communicate. So we have lots of those. But, but with all of this that is happening around the beginning of a project, we still go back to the plan and the section and how the building is organized, the clarity of that organization. 
and the clarity of the section. And I think, um, I think that having that as a fundamental backbone to your, to your process, I think is important. The thing that I've also, you know, I teach a little bit too. And the thing that I've begun over the last 10 years to teach is I think it's an amazing exercise to pick a material first. Like when you're starting, pick, pick wood, pick concrete, pick steel, pick, pick whatever you want and understand that material. Find images of that material. Find what that, find what that material is. And then begin to make a building because in the way openings are made, in the way structure is made, with the way light is let in, with the way that it meets the earth, with the way that it meets the sky, it all comes back to that sense of materiality. And, and, and so I've, I've learned through teaching, I think I learn more than my students <laughs> do. Um, uh, and, and this kind of sense of beginning with the material and the light, I think is, is, a, is a kind of an amazing lesson. It'd be interesting to try that for a semester. Yeah. Oh, actually, Shauna, uh, you, you were basically, you opened the question that I was going to ask exactly, trying to put ourselves in the mind of our students and uh, how, to, uh, how to understand light, how, what, what the process of understanding light, particularly in section, as you explained. And I'm going to confess something um, that for the first 40 minutes of your lectures, I was very worried because we were only looking at fabulous renderings or photographs of the buildings. And I was like saying, well, when are we gonna start seeing the drawings, the plans, the sections that are probably quite remarkable? And then suddenly, that's a great, it's sort of a apotheosis, uh, they exploded with Varso. And, and so I, I thank you very much because I think probably, um, showing those images, showing those models, those quite incredible models, showing the models on the four facades, really to so understand the, the building as an object, but also within the context of Warsaw was extraordinary. So I was worried, but I ended up very elated by, by what happened. But I'm still, I'm still um, questioning on that same issue of exactly um, how do you proceed? Are you proceeding mostly in, in, most proceeding in model, uh, in terms of studying those rooms, but you, for example, the Gladstone, or are you uh, proceeding also perhaps using even uh, modern technology, like rendering to understand the light quasi-scientifically? How, really, how do you really uh, develop those, uh, those um, approach? Well, you know, we do a little bit everything. You know, we, we, we build a lot of big, big models in our studio. Uh, I, I like things that are big. I can begin to put my head in it and understand more. But we also work in Rhino and we work in rendering um, and we take models out on the street and up on the roof to see the light and the way the light is moving. And uh, you know, we, we just, um, we're a little bit, we're a little bit frantic, I think, during the design process. We just try to find, we keep searching and trying to find tools that work for us for this particular project and, and change and move and, um, you know, just kind of trust the process and trusting our own intuition there to just keep working until we can find it um, find something that resonates with us. But, you know, at the same time, we're drawing a plan and a section. We're, we're working on it in Rhino. We're building models. And it's all one, it's all one process. And I think what I've learned through teaching, too, is that it's, it's important to build wood models and to have students go into the wood model shop with a saw with, and cut these buildings out, exactly. see it in progress, 
don't use these three dimensional carving, carving machines because you lose this sense that I had when I was in school of just building a model and seeing how it's built. You know, when you just get two walls up and you look at that and you watch it being made and you watch it going up and you make changes as the model is being built, that process has really been valuable for us. I can't tell you how many models we've started and then we've come back down to the ground and we build it up again and we photograph it and we build it down a little bit and then it comes up again. And so this sense of doing a wood model yourself and feeling the nature of that wood as part of your process is a, I, I think that's a really valuable lesson that's been hugely helpful for us. Thank you. I wanted to say also, I have not been to Warsaw. This is really the opportunity to go when the building was completed. But I, I, um, I've always liked the Palace of the People, or I think that's the name that it is called, the, the sort of Russian inspired. And, but I think the, what is quite remarkable, it seems to me in your project, is that there is a, I feel a lot of respect actually for that architecture, which I know has been very much uh, either neglected or horrified, or you know, by by the the citizen for very often in the history, because this is a the 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 completion of a long process. No, these buildings have been in in discussion, and and that plaza has been discussion. So, I, I'm really uh, I think some of your rendering where you see the neoclassical facades of the sides of the palace, and in contrast with the black theater, are actually. The, the, the proof that you can actually, the, the contrast is actually working for both buildings, both for the old one and for you, for yours, which I, I really feel very exciting from an yeah. urban design point of view. Thank you. I mean, one little fact that I didn't mention, you know, the palace was built by the um, Soviet Union in 1955. You know what happened that same year? Seagram's Crown Hall and Rorschach were <laughs> built yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you, you kind of get a sense of the history of Warsaw. I mean, that, that, that building is not an 18th century building or a, you know, mm -hmm. or a 19th century building even, you know, it is, it is built as this kind of mask for, I think, oppression. Um, and, but, but the people of Warsaw have turned that around. Exactly. Finally, after all these years, they have turned it around and they now call it the Palace of Culture and they own it. Yeah. And when there's a celebration to be happening, they come there and, um, and our buildings are at the foot of that, of, of that building. So it's a, it's a really interesting life that that city has had. I have a quick, a quick question on that following up. You know, it's kind of um, perfect scenario for you to be able to do two buildings, you know, and have that juxtaposition of this dark, deep building and then, you know, the, the modern white building. And was it your idea to pull the theater out and be its own building? Or was that always part of sort of the plan to have these two buildings? Because if you just had one building, you know, which one would you choose or which aesthetic? Like it, it doesn't seem like the project could exist as a single building the way you've presented it. Well, that's, that's a really, really good question. And first of all, the building was a competition mm -hmm. and I can't imagine why they picked an American to come over to Warsaw in the middle of this city and interpret the history and interpret these buildings that sat in front of that is that has befuddled me for a long time. Secondly, we had, I mean, I was in torture for two years trying to make these buildings because in fact, anytime I would try to make them out of the same material, both directors of the theater and, and the museum, they wanted their own building. They wanted to have their own identity. They wanted the building to come from themselves rather than coming from some joint arts building, which, and you know, to get that in your head and to figure out what that means and how that gets expressed took two years. And I mean, we had buildings that looked alike. We had one that was light gray, one that was white. You know, I mean, I, I dare pull out 
the 20 different ideas that we had for that. And finally, we, we, we kind of saw ourselves in the middle of the site one day and just thought these buildings had to be strong buildings that would, that would kind of stand on their own between the commercial architecture and this palace with its history. And we then started to think of a building that was black and the theater. All these years when we were going there, we went to see these performances by this theater company and they all seemed very dark. They were, they were not only dark metaphorically, they were in, you know, there weren't a lot of lights there on the, on the stage and these dark kind of places. And then the museum was basically an old glass building in the city. This beautiful modernist building, small, but it was glass and it accepted a lot of light. And so sooner or later, we just began to feel this notion of having these two, um, these two materials define the work. So thank you very much, Thomas. Um, thank you for sharing your work with us and for allowing us to inhabit your mind for just an hour. Uh, and we hope that someday Dean and Hori will be able to invite you as a visiting critic. <laughs> I would, I would absolutely love that, and uh, you know, I'd love to. Anytime a jury or you know, I'm, I would be, I would love to participate. Thank you. So, I'm um, on the spot. I mean, he, this was not pre-planned. <laughs> well, so, it, it's thank been, you very it's much. Been really nice, and um, and I have absolutely enjoyed it, and it's great to meet all of you. Thank awesome. you. Hopefully, thank you will be able to come to Miami the next time. I would love to. Thank you Thank all. You. Thank, Thank you very, you very much. much. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.